Hello, and welcome to the Starseed Kitchen podcast. I'm your host, Chef Whitney Aronoff, and today I am so excited to be chatting with Andrea Beeman. Did I pronounce that correctly, Andrea? That's correct. <laughs> okay, perfect. So Andrea Beeman is a natural food chef, thyroid expert, holistic health coach, and herbalist dedicated to natural healing and sustainable eating and living. She educates people how to heal and prevent disease using ancient time-tested wisdom. As a keynote speaker and teacher, Andrea inspires audiences to take action on their health. She teaches engaging cooking demos and health programs through live conferences, schools, and online reaching audiences around the world. She is the author of three books that help you take back your health and manage your well being. One is The Whole Truth How I Naturally Reclaimed My Health, and You Can Too. The Eating and Recipe Guide Better Food, Better Health, and Health is Wealth Make a Delicious Investment in You. And she's also the author of Happy Healthy Thyroid is The Essential Steps to Healthy healing naturally. Andrea Beeman makes learning about better health, good food, and sustainable living a joyful experience for everyone. It's true. (laughs) You do. (laughs) And I know this firsthand because I met you many years ago, I think back in 2015 or 2016, when I was in culinary school at the Natural Gourmet Institute, and you were teaching one of your evening educational classes, and I got to be one of the chef assistants. Oh, I love the Natural Gourmet Institute. It was one of my favorite places to teach because we had so many students that would come in and they would, you know, help in the sous chef in the kitchen. And it made yeah. it, it made the experience so easy because I know Good. that people are um, intimidated to get into the kitchen because of, they think of all the work that has to be done. But if you have um, everything set up and if you have a sous chef or like five sous chefs, it's really easy, <laughs> but not everybody has that. But I'm happy that my husband who attended Natural Gourmet yes. does help in the kitchen because it makes it easier. Like if somebody's cooking, the other person is cleaning. That's the dream. Yeah, <laughs> that's the dream. Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, it was so nice being, you know, doing classes at the Natural Gourmet, in- Gourmet mm-hmm. Institute because you had so many students there that were so eager to assist you you know, and there was such a great positive attitude at that school, um, which really affected, I think, the experience for everyone, the quality of the food, the taste, all that. It was a real special place. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I think the, one of the reasons why it was special is because it was a focus on health, right? It was a focus on health and well-being as opposed to like, let's say, not, not getting down on Chef Gordon Ramsay or anything like that, but Lord knows, I, I don't know if you want to get into one of his kitchens, right? You know, like yeah. with all that screaming and all that anger, because in the in the natural wellness field, we understand that everything is energy, right? Yes. So what is the energy that you are bringing into the kitchen and putting into the dishes and putting into the food? You know, I don't want, I don't want the angry energy in my food, no matter what it is. Um, you know, and props to Chef Ramsay, he's got Michelin stars but he may be missing some other ingredients. (laughs) Absolutely. That can make his food taste better. And I think the best lesson that I took away from being a student at the Natural Gourmet Institute was that there's no right way Mm -hmm. that you really have to learn to trust your intuition. You can read a recipe once or twice, but you have to execute and you have to trust yourself when you're executing and know that you're just going to do the best that you can. And it's going to turn out. Um, There's no one right way to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. That takes a lot of the pressure off people when they get in the kitchen. I think so too, but I want to talk a little bit more about you and how you serve, um, you know, essentially humanity, how you serve the health and wellness community, um, what people reach out to you for. So can you just briefly share a little bit more about your background as a holistic uh, nutritionist and chef? Yeah. So, um, I was never, I wasn't a classically trained, trained chef. I, um, I started my journey of learning about food when my mom got sick in the 19, well, she was, she got a breast cancer in the 1980s. And at that time she had a radical mastectomy and she had her breasts removed and all the skin and the lymph nodes and all that taken off. And, um, and she went through the traditional 
modern treatments of chemotherapy and radiation. So we thought that she was clear after five years, but um, 11 years after she was cleared by the doctors and the medical world, right? Uh, the cancer came back, except now it was everywhere. It was in her brain, it was in her bones, it was in her lungs, it was in her liver, like everywhere. So um, my dad, thankfully had read an article. I think it was in Time Magazine. I don't, I don't even remember. It was so long ago. He read an article about a doctor that had healed his pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. you know, by changing his diet. And uh, so my dad said, okay, we're going to go the, the route of, you know, going through chemotherapy and all that stuff again. He said, but we're going to try and change mom's diet. And he told me about the book. And then I went up and I went to a macrobiotic Institute and I started to learn about food and it made so much sense to me. Like when I was learning about what to do for my mom with her cancer, that the food that we eat creates our blood, which creates our cells, which feeds all of our organs and our skin and our brain and our bones and all of our processes. And if we're eating food that is loaded with chemicals and crap and uh, not healthy, then we're going to absorb that mm -hmm. and it's going to become us. It's gonna assimilate into our body and become us on a cellular level. So that made so much sense to me. And I was like, wow, it's just, it just makes so much sense. There was, I couldn't even deny the sense that it was just, it was like not rocket science. It was just like, simply you are what you eat. It's like what the grandmothers used to say, right? Yes. You are what you eat. So I studied macrobiotics and my mom didn't make it through her second bout with cancer. She died, but it was a brilliant uh, life lesson for me because it planted in me the seed that if anything happens to me, I'm going to try food first. I'll try to change my diet, my lifestyle first before committing to taking an organ out or anything like that. So absolutely. Yes. But that we're not given that option with modern mm -hmm. medicine. So when I was 28 years old, five years after my mom, actually it was four years after my mom uh, died. Um, I was diagnosed with a thyroid disease and uh, I was given the option to do radioactive iodine and then take Synthroid for the rest of my life. And as soon as the doctor said radioactive iodine, I was like, boop, all the little red flags came up and I'm like, I don't want radioactive anything. You could just keep that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to say ixnay on the, oh, on the radio radiation. That's not yeah. happening. And, um, and I said to my doctor, look, I'm going to, I want to change my diet and my lifestyle before I do any radioactive anything and then take medication for the rest of my life. And this was 25 years ago. And my doctor said, your diet and your lifestyle have nothing to do with your disease. And I said, oh, you know, I get that, that you've been taught that, but I'm going to try something else first. So I left the doctor's office and I radically just, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just changing my diet. At the time I was a chronic dieter. Whitney, okay. I was like, um, uh, no fat, low fat girl, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> everything that was labeled that, you know, the, the low fat, non-fat cookies, ice cream, everything yes. with the artificial sugar and artificial ingredients. Crap. Yeah. <laughs> that was really being sold in the nineties. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. And I was hook, line and sinker. That was the world that I lived in. Yeah. Even though I had watched what happened with my mom and I knew that there was a connection between food and illness, I still took the trajectory of not eating well, because this is what happens with most people. We have to wait until an illness comes before we make a change, Yeah, which is unfortunate, but, um, it's, that's just life, right? You know, like uh, we're not taught, it's not, we're not taught that at a young age that you can really change the trajectory of your health by, um, implementing foods and herbs and all that stuff. So when my sickness came and I changed my diet and my lifestyle within four months, Whitney, within four months, I lost 22 pounds without dieting because I was not, I was not on a diet. I was just yeah. eating food. Uh, I lost 22 pounds. My goiter started shrinking. My heart palpitations calmed down. I started to sleep at night. My nails stopped splitting. My hair stopped splitting. And um, my skin cleared up because I used to have cystic acne. You know, I'd get those big acnes here and all on yeah. my chin. And, um, and I went back to my doctor four months later and she took another blood test and she said, okay, she goes, your thyroid levels have changed. They're no longer dangerous, um, but you're, this is, you're still not normal and you're going to need to take a medication. Just, you know, <laughs> just accept it. Just comply. <laughs> just comply. 
<laughs> and I said, I'm not, I said, thank you. I said, but I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and see what happens. Yeah. So for the, yeah, for the next two years, I went to see a new doctor every six months uh, because at the time I was working for MTV networks and I had insurance. I haven't had health insurance in 20 something years, but back then I had insurance. So I could just go around and hop around all the different doctors that I wanted. So I went to a new doctor every six months and every six months I was told that I had a new disease. So first it was hyperthyroid and the large goiter. And then it was hypothyroid, which is the opposite condition. And then it was Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid condition. So, uh, and by the, by the 18th month, my goiter was completely gone and my thyroid levels were almost completely normal. And, um, uh, I know today that Hashimoto's, which is in the autoimmune thyroid condition has nothing to do with the thyroid and more to do with your stress and your digestive system, <laughs> nothing to do with the thyroid. The thyroid's just the gland that's getting attacked, right? So if I would have listened to the first doctor yeah. and radiated my thyroid, I would have never known that my digestive health was completely out of balance and that um, uh, my stress levels were through the roof. Uh, you know, like there's so many things I wouldn't have learned. I would have just complied destroyed my body, not learned anything from the experience, and then been on a medication for the rest of my life, which doesn't serve me or my health, but it certainly serves a bigger industry. Yeah. That's amazing that you- That's my story. It's amazing that you were able to accept the experience and learn from it, and then take that wisdom and share it with other people. And what I find really interesting about what you did, which most of us just don't put the time and energy into doing is you continue to reach research and find thyroid doctors and go and get second opinions. So you can see, you know, straight in front of your face, how, you know, there's just no education at that time about what the thyroid is and all these, you know, different health issues that people and symptoms people have. That's really yeah. impressive. Well, thanks. You know, like uh, I'm, I'm stubborn. My, my dad was stubborn and I'm stubborn. And if somebody tells me you can't do this, you can't possibly heal your condition. You can't. Right. I'm like, I'm going to find a way to get in there and find another route. You know, like I'm persistent when it comes to that stuff. And, um, and even though on that two year journey of discovery, there were setbacks and you, you know, oh, this happened. Oh, now that happened. Um, and then even after my two year initial healing period, even after that, I was still learning and I'm still learning today. Now, 25 years later, yeah. right. Actually 26 years later, I'll be 54. And that happened when I was 28. And, you know, like I'm always learning, like when I was um, in my thirties, early thirties from learning, you know, still studying more, I went vegan and in the first two years, I was like, wow, I feel really great, really light, connected to the universe, the whole yeah. thing. And then my body started to hurt, <laughs> right? My, my, you know, my, my muscles, they started to feel like really weak. I'd walk up the stairs and I'd hear creaking in my knees. And I was like, this is not normal. So I had to change again. I had to listen to my body and do more research and say, so, okay, my body is literally talking to me and it's saying that something's out of balance and it's not right. So uh, then I went to, um, uh, I, at one point, Whitney, I, I, I cooked a duck and I almost ate the whole duck in one sitting. I was so deficient and yes. I just listened to my body and yes. I literally, I took a spoon and I drank the duck fat out of the pan. Yeah. Because you hadn't had any animal fat in so long. Yes. I had the same experience when I was in my twenties, I moved to LA. Um, this was long before being vegan was a thing. And I became vegan because I just wanted to you know, be really skinny and look really good. And I ate a healthy vegan diet. I was eating whole foods. I wasn't mm. eating any of that, um, all the vegan processed food that's out now, you know, there was no processed vegan cheese or, you know, anything like that. I was really eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, but it wasn't right for my body. Mm. And I stopped producing bile. I stopped digesting what I was even consuming that was healthy. Mm -hmm. My skin turned yellow. Um, I started to develop so many health issues, no energy. You know, the first year, year and a half, 
I had the same experience of you. You feel great. You feel light. Your, um, your psychic abilities are stronger and more powerful. You're, you feel more connected to your intuition. And then you, for me, you just crash. Yeah. Nose dive. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we are our greatest, um, our greatest ability to experiment and understand how this vessel is supposed to work. But the thing is, there's so much ancient wisdom out there where mm. if we had or had been taught the way to respect our body and feed it, mm. we wouldn't have to experiment this way. Mm. Um, and that's what I'm hoping, you know, and that's what I think you're doing is you're helping people from experimenting with all these new age diets and really eat a traditional holistic way that's just going to fuel them and support them throughout their changes in their, in their life. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I, I like what you said. You said um, that you felt connected more to your intuition and when you were vegan, right? Yeah. Because the vessel was empty, yes. right? And animal products are dense. They're dense and they're heavy. So even today, if I have something to do and I feel blocked or stuck, or um, I can't, I can't get it started, right? Whatever it is that I need to do, I'll fast. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then the clarity comes, oh, this is what I need to do. Like uh, the connection, right? You're not yes. weighed down in the physical body. Um, so there's, uh, even from all of that stuff that you learned and that I learned, there's ways to implement it in the, the way that you are today without going to the extremes. That is a great suggestion because at the same time, we need the animal products to stay grounded in this physical body and in this experience, which is so mm -hmm. important. We can't keep wanting to leave our body and leave this space and leave this experience. This is what we're here for, but you're absolutely right. Sometimes you need to tap into your higher self and, or your guides and angels or whatever spiritual practice you have, and you need more clarity. Be and that is a brilliant idea. Well, that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, so when people come to you for thyroid support, um, how do you often break them into changing their diet or lifestyle to help adjust their thyroid health? Well, mostly people are coming to me that are there or they've already dipped their toe in the water of health and wellness, right? So it's not like they're coming from a standard American diet, which is mm -hmm. would be much harder to work with, right? The standard American diet people are, they have to make big, big shifts, right? Mm -hmm. they, you know, I'm going to take them off the packaged food and get them onto food that comes from a farm, <laughs> right? So this is a big big shift. Um, but mostly people that come to me already have their toe dipped in the water. So they're hip to it. And I just have to make tweaks. So they may be eating tons and tons and tons of supplements, but not absorbing or digesting because the digestive system isn't well, right? So they, they decided that they want to get healthy, but their digestive system is still a mess. So sometimes we need to work on the digestive system first. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of tweaking the lifestyle, right? Somebody could be eating the best foods in the world, but if their stress is high, yeah. they're not, they're going to have difficulty absorbing. They're going to have trouble um, digesting. So we have to find ways to calm them down or they may not be sleeping. Let's say um, when the heart is unsettled, it'll wake you in the night, mostly, right? The, and that's that's from ancient medicine, right? The heart needs to be settled in order to calm the system down so it can sleep peacefully. Mm -hmm. But if there's a, an emotional thing that happened during the day, I mean, we all know if there's an emotional thing that's going on, you're not going to sleep unless you cry yourself to bed, right? Yes. You're going to cry yourself to sleep, then you're going to bed, <laughs> right? You got to get it all up and out. You but do. You do. So if someone is waking in the middle of the night, and I hear this a lot from clients, especially these days, they're waking with anxiety. It's yeah. because the heart is unsettled from things that transpired during the day while they are in the waking life. So the, they can't get into that slumber because this is still unsettled, whatever it was, whether it was they're unsettled about what's happening in the world or in their relationship or in their life, whatever it is. So this will wake up and here come the thoughts. 
Yeah. And then they have their cell phone in the room. So the EMF is constantly pinging their body. So yes. even they can't see it. There's something constantly tapping them, you know, keeping them awake. And again, yes. they just can't find that opportunity to just settle. If they're going to keep their cell phone in the room, it has to be on airplane mode. Yeah. That it, they cannot, it, this is, this is so dangerous. I know they're so, they, they, they give us so much um, freedom, the cell phones, but they don't actually give us freedom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's just a tool that you have to be mindful of. You yes. Know? It's yeah. Okay. It's like chocolate. You just have to be mindful. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're talking about food. This is food, right? It's what yeah. we're taking into our vessel, into our system, through our eyes, through our ears, right? It's, it, we're absorbing it. So what are we absorbing? Are we absorbing all the fear mongering that's going on in the world? Are we absorbing all the drama that's happening? Are we absorbing all the white light at night when we shouldn't be, <laughs> our pineal gland should be going, okay, it's time for bedtime. Yeah. Instead of you get the white light and, and the pineal gland is going, okay, let's go wake up. We need sugar. We got to get moving. And it's like, you know, 12 o'clock at night because you just turned off your phone. Uh, you know, so there's so many tweaks to make um, to help somebody get onto the path or a better trajectory of where they want to be with their health. So with thyroid, we have to be really conscious these days because radiation negatively impacts all of your cells, but specifically it really starts to hurt the thyroid and we are bombarded by radiation everywhere, everywhere yeah. on this earth. You can't even get away from it. Like we have satellites in the, in the atmosphere that just, bombarding the earth with all that radiation. And um, so we have to be very careful. So one of the things that I do recommend to my clients are sea vegetables, because sea vegetables bind with uh, radioactive waste or radioactive strontium and helps to take it out of the body, remove it from the body. So um, uh, I do recommend seaweeds often to the people that are struggling with thyroid disease. And um, even for the people that aren't struggling with thyroid disease, yeah. I think that they need seaweed because they're getting bombarded everywhere by radiation. So it's, it's good to have the, the foods and the things that will bind to those dangerous particles that we're absorbing and help to excrete them from the body. The only way I tend to have seaweed, I buy the Eden Foods kombu and I'll mm. add the kombu in with bone broth or with soups. Uh, that's the easiest way that I'm able to get the seaweed into my diet. And then sometimes I'll take that seaweed and puree it into the soup. Other times I'll just discard it depending on the broth or the soup that I'm making. How do you recommend to clients to start to get the seaweed into their diet? Exactly what you said, because it's a water element, right? It, it grows, it thrives in the water, yeah. right? So, uh, seaweed is, um, and even if you look at seaweed, right, it's very flowy and flexible and you could wash it, you know, watch it when it's, under the water, it's like moving very gracefully, mm -hmm. generally. And when we eat it, it's best eaten in a water environment. So like you said, you Beautiful. put it into a soup, you put it into a broth. Um, I tell my clients, put it in with beans, uh, yes. you know, cause it's hard to sit and eat a lump of seaweed. It's, <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie, it's, it's difficult, <laughs> you know? So put it into the water element because it'll practically disappear. That's you know, mostly. Suggestion. Yeah. Do you ever put it in your bath? So one time Ooh. when I was in Ireland, I went and I did a seaweed bath. I went to the spa. They collected all the seaweed off the coast there and they put it into your bathtub. So you absorb all the benefits straight into your skin. Do you ever take fresh seaweed or dried seaweed and throw it into the tub? No, I don't. But when I go to the, to the beach, I'm always conscious that I am in the water element with the seaweed where the seaweed lives. Yes. Uh, but when I was, I did a long time ago, I did a, um, a show called uh, wise up and it was on a Varia network. Varia means truth, right? Veritas truth, <laughs> truth network. And, um, and we did a seaweed bath in Sedona, Arizona. Oh. And after the seaweed bath, I can't even begin to tell you how great my body felt. It was unbelievable. And, you know, I haven't continued with it because, you know, who's going to put the seaweed in unless you're at a spa, who's yeah. going to put the seaweed into the bath? Oh, it's not putting <laughs> it in. It's who's cleaning up afterwards. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. That's the worst part. So yes, I leave that to somebody else, but my natural habit ever since I was a little girl, cause I grew up at the beach whenever I was in the water and I'd see tons of seaweed, I'd always swim towards it and I would rub it all over my body. I wow. And if there were really big kelp beds that were floating in the water that had released from the, from the rocks or the bottom of the seafloor, I would lay on top of the seaweed beds and just float on them as if they were, were boogie boards. Oh my um, God. You're, you're a mermaid. Isn't that, <laughs> I just, I love the feeling of it in the water. And, um, I love it's a natural it. emollient. It's very softening. Yeah. And it has that, that film on it that just yeah. feels so good on the skin. Um, Yes. And it's that same film yes. that when I talk about the digestive wellness, it's that same mucilage yes. that helps to cool the inflammation in the gut and to give that, that gut, it's, um, that bit of a film that it's, it may be needing. So, uh, it's, it, it's exactly energetically is exactly what you're talking about. It's fully moisturizing the gut lining. So mm -hmm. then your waste can properly eliminate. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So when you're working with clients, is there a particular meal in the day that's the hardest for people to edit or to change? I think that would have to be breakfast. Because in America here, we we've grown up with the idea of Dunkin' Donuts and a coffee, <laughs> right? Or, you know, like some stimulant and some sugar pastry, <laughs> right? Yeah, in the, the downer and the upper. Yes. And so I, I think that people oftentimes will think, what can I possibly eat if it's not that or cold cereal with cold milk, which is another thing that we've been indoctrinated into believing is a breakfast, right? This, this cracker box cereal, yeah. right? So that can be, that can be tough. And I always encourage the, my clients and my students that our idea of breakfast doesn't have to be breakfast. It could be a soup. It could be, you know, some stock, like in the wintertime, a nourishing little mug of bone stock to start your day. Wow. Before you even eat anything really great for the gut, uh, you know, and then after that, have some eggs, have some good old fashioned, you know, eggs on sourdough toast or oatmeal with, uh, you know, uh, fruit and nuts, you know, switch it up, switch yes. it up. Cause we get into these habits of having the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. But I, I think that we're doing ourselves a disservice and our gut a disservice when we don't rotate our foods and eat a variety of things rather than the same thing over and over again. I'm um, so glad you mentioned that because I was just having a conversation with my brother. He was asking me about what he's having for breakfast, what I'm having for breakfast right now, since we're kind of transitioning, um, you know, seasons. And, and he asked me, you know, is it okay to have the oat groats with blueberries? You know, some, some people are saying that you can't have the grains with the blueberries or with the fruit. And I said, you know, when I have it this way, it makes me feel so good. Yeah. And I stay full all the way till, till lunch. I have energy, you know, oat groats, flax, ground flaxseed, flaxseed oil, a fresh berry is really working for me. And then I mentioned, you know, this is not what I eat year round. I always right. adjust every few months because my body tells me it wants something else for breakfast. So then maybe yeah. I'll switch and have two hard boiled eggs with like a little fermented vegetable and some steamed veggies or a little brown rice. It's constantly changing. Yeah. And it always has to do with the weather, um, I find. Um, but it's nice to hear from other people that it's okay to have something different for breakfast. You know, oh, yeah, you totally. To the same routine going all the time. And it doesn't have to be traditional. Yeah. And the same food over and over and over again, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or uh, even if somebody's let's say eating broccoli all the time, broccoli, 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 not healthy. You know, like um, we have a diverse microbiome mm -hmm. and the bacteria in our gut needs a variety to, to be fed and within the different seasons, like you were talking about. So like, um, I believe in the bigger picture that the human being is connected to the earth and the earth is a living thing. And there are cycles and seasons on the planet. And wherever you live, 
the environment will change. There'll be cycles and seasons in that environment. And that means that the foods will also have their own cycles and seasons. So roots may be much better in the fall and the winter, whereas fruits and berries in the summertime and tomatoes, right? Juicy, plump, delicious, uh, you know, and in the wintertime, way more hearty stuff, yes. you know, like we're going to be always changing. And when we change that food that we're eating, we're feeding a more diverse group of bacteria. If we're just eating the same thing over and over and over and over again, we're going to feed a limited number of bacteria. And guess what that's going to lead to? SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because you have one specific type of bacteria that's being fed over and over and over. It's that growing is. out of control. <laughs> that's where that comes from. That makes perfect sense. Explain that way. Yeah. You know, like we, um, we have disconnected thanks to modern technology, we have disconnected from the cycles and the seasons. And when you go to the grocery store, everything is available all year round, no matter what season it is. But if you go to your local farmer's market, you're going to see that the, the food actually shifts and changes each season. Yeah. Right. So I live in New York and in April at the farmer's market and in May and June, I can't get a peach. <laughs> I, and they're not coming till August, right? But I can get, I can get wintered broccoli rob. I can get all the roots that I want. They're all still there. Um, so when when I disconnect from what the machine has set up for us, and I look at what the earth naturally provides for us, it makes the journey to understanding food and what could possibly work for your body a little easier. Absolutely. So in this winter season, what do you enjoy having for breakfast? Well, like yesterday I had oats. I had um, oats with um, chopped walnuts and pecans. I put in a little bit of half and half because I like cream. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Oat growth Delicious. with raw cream on top. So good. So good. <laughs> Beyond. And you don't yeah. have much. It's just a nope. little bit. Oh, yep. heaven. Yeah. And you know, like I'll have congee, I'll have miso soup. Mm. I'll have like things that are not traditional breakfast. I'll eat that kind of stuff. Today I had, um, um, a poached egg on top of toast with sour, a sourdough toast with butter and jam. Yeah. Right. Oh, and I had some, uh, chopped up, um, uh, kimchi. How do you like to do your, um, your congee? Cause I love congee. It's oh, so I love good. it too. It's yeah. so good. I'll take um, one cup of uh, either rice that I soaked overnight or leftover rice. And then I'll put nine cups of either broth, uh, you know, either a chicken broth or a beef broth or a mushroom broth. And, and then I'll cook it slow and low for, uh, you know, an hour or so. And in that broth, I'll put in astragalus root. Sometimes I'll put in some ginseng as well. Yeah. Cause I, you know, it's just so yummy and so delicious and nourishing. And, um, and then when I, when my kanji is almost finished, I'll saute my, um, onions, bok choy, shiitake mushrooms, um, you know, anything, carrots, anything that I'm putting in the kanji. And then I'll put a little miso at the end. And then, um, I'll take, you know, sometimes I'll do like a can of sardines, like such an old fashioned thing. Yeah. I'm probably getting tons of metals in my body. I don't care. <laughs> I'm eating everything that's going to take it out. Yeah. Um, so I'll take my kanji. I'll chop up some uh, kimchi, put it on top, put a couple of sardines and that's a breakfast. Well, the great thing is you can get sardines in a jar now in a glass jar, you know, so everyone can get their sardines um, not fresh if they want to, because you can find at most health food stores, the sardines in a glass jar. Yeah. And the tuna comes in a glass jar too now. I know. And it's so good in the olive oil. You can really make that traditional so kind delicious. of fabulous Spanish, you know, salad de soie or French salad de soie with the, with the um, tuna and olive oil. I just love it. Um, do you have a kanji recipe on your website? I do. Okay. I'm going to check that out. That sounded so good. What you described. Yeah, it's yummy. And I put in the ginseng and the astragalus as extra support for the yeah. immune system. Um, and you could get that at any herb store and you okay. just drop it into the, you know, into the broth. Yeah. Where do you like to go in New York to get your dried herbs like that? Or do you order them online? Well, I order from flower power downtown. Um, oh, I've been the, there. 
in the East Village. Yeah, they're yeah. great. They don't have a lot of the Chinese herbs, so they don't have the ginseng and the astragalus. So that I'll order online from like Star West Botanicals or Mountain Rose Herbs or something like that. Um, but uh, but they have all of the Flower Power has a lot of herbs. They just don't have a lot of the Chinese herbs. So I like to use them both. Absolutely. Um, what are some of the challenges people are coming to you with now? So I know a lot of people reach out to you for nutrition support um, for their thyroid, but are there other things people are coming to you with that they're looking for someone to help, um, you know, help them move through and release? Oh yeah. So for years, like when, when I first got started with my business, I was macrobiotic, you know, 20 something years ago. So from that, a lot of people that have cancer find macrobiotics. So oftentimes I'll get a lot of people that send me their aunt and their uncle, and this one has cancer and that one has cancer. So I'll get the cancer people. Um, but also lately, the people that are coming the most are the ones with anxiety. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, like I always have thyroid people that come, you know, yeah. I have a lot of thyroid people, but a lot of anxiety, sleeplessness. Um, I think stress is running really high for a lot of people. Yeah. And, um, even people that are, have been healthy for a long time are feeling the effects of all of the stress and they just want somebody to, uh, be accountable to. Yeah. Right. So they'll take, they'll say, okay, I need, I need to do this. I need to get back on track and I need to be accountable. And then they'll hire me for that kind of stuff too. Um, so it's, it's a nice variety, nice variety of people you know, and, uh, I, d d digestive health is always a big one too <laughs> forever. Right. Absolutely. So what do you think the challenges are going to be for, for people like you and I to continue to eat healthy over the next 10 years? So you and I both don't live in a place where we can grow our own fruits and vegetables. You know, it's a little harder when you live in a city and you don't have a large backyard. So we really rely on our farmer's markets and our grocery stores to provide us with the fresh, healthy food to nourish ourselves. Um, what do you think our challenges are going to be coming up in the future? Okay. So you're that's pretty, you're pretty informed. So yeah. <laughs> and that is a loaded question because I know. Yeah, because of what's going on in the world right now with all of the restrictions and the lockdowns and if you haven't had the medical injection, you can't go into the stores. Like I have clients in um the Netherlands and Australia and you know all over the world. And I I'm in shock. I can't even believe some of the stuff that I'm hearing from them that they're not allowed to shop in the supermarkets unless they have a Oh, injection. So sad. It's so sad. So I know that what's happening over there, it's just a matter of time before it comes here. And it's already started. Like in New York, you're not allowed into restaurants, right? You're not allowed in a restaurant. And even they, for a five-year-old, not allowed in a restaurant without an injection. What? These are like the least people that are going to get sick, right? A five-year-old kid. I think there's like zero deaths. Um, but so the challenge moving forward is that more and more restrictions are going to be put on people, limiting their freedoms. And with that as a possibility, because it's it hasn't happened yet, right? And I, I, I try not to um, focus on the negative, but I stay in the, in the reality <laughs> as yeah. often as possible. And the reality is that those restrictions may be coming here as well um, to that extent. And if they do, if you choose to take care of your health like I do and not get an injection or need an injection for anything, yeah. um, then you won't be able to shop. So with that being said, it is imperative that you join a local CSA. You cut it's out the middle. Suggestion. Yeah. Cut out the middleman entirely. You won't have to go to a grocery store. You won't have to go to your local whole foods. You go direct to your farmer, get to know your farmers in your community join a CSA. You're going to save a ton of money, by the way, when you join a CSA, you save a lot of money, but you're also going to get to know who is actually growing your food and you're going to build a relationship with them. And when you have a relationship with them, things change, meaning uh, you don't have a relationship with the, the whole foods market. So they can look goodbye, put you, right. Oh, you don't have the little stamp or you don't have the injection or you don't have the little card. You can't come in here. 
But if you are in relationship with your local farmer, they're dropping off your food. Here you go. Here's your food. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right. Um, so it's a it's a different type of relationship. Um, you know, hopefully the powers that be won't try to impede on that relationship as well. That's a fantastic suggestion and really something that we should do now, because yep. when you join a CSA, it's not unlimited. You know, 50 million people can't join the CSA. They only right. produce so much food on their farm. So I'd rather get on the list now than in three to five years when everyone's begging to get on the list because they aren't able to find the fresh fruits and vegetables they're looking for at their grocery store anymore. Um, yeah. and in the abundance that there used to be. So that's a great, great suggestion. And then you're forced to eat seasonally. Like you really <laughs> can't fight it. And nope. then you're forced to try new foods or new cooking techniques in the kitchen. And yep. that's always healthy for us to kind of break out of our routines and, oh, totally. and learn to do new things. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting because you said you don't know if the, the grocery stores are going to have the products on the shelves or the produce on the shelves. Um, with the, the food supply chain right now is um, um, compromised. So when I go to my, my little health food store and the local Whole Foods here, I already see shelves that are empty. Like- It could be the Amazon shoppers. <laughs> <laughs> taking everything. <laughs> well, cause I, you know, I'm a personal chef. So I go to the grocery store seven days a week for my clients mm. and I shop first thing in the morning, um, because there's the least amount of people at the mm. store and I can, um, you know, I can work with the people that are there to find the things that I need in the back of the store. I can get through the checkout faster. Mm. It's much more efficient first thing in the morning, but I come in at 7 30 AM and some of the shelves in certain areas will be completely wiped out. And it's mm. usually because the Amazon shoppers start at 5 a.m. Wow. Yeah. And so if, you know, there's certain areas, yeah, it'll be because I go in every single day to the same grocery stores. So I can walk in one day and the paleo mayo and the brown rice quinoa pasta will be there. And then the next day I come at 7 30 a.m. and there's nothing in sight. Mm. So it's just very interesting. You know, you kind of never, you, we will never really know what's happening with the supply chain, but right. my number one focus is always fruits, vegetables, and the pasture raised, you know, meats, the wild caught fish, um, and my olive oils, butter and ghee. Yeah. So like, that's very interesting. So same thing for me, the the staples that I get from the supermarkets are like the oils and the things that I cannot get from my CSA, but my CSA, I'm blessed. I love my CSA. I've been a part of it for 20 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I get six months of produce and then they have connections to the other farmers in the area. So I can get all of my meat and my eggs and my honey and my butter everything from all of the local farmers that they are connected to. Amazing. And I, all I have to do is put in an order online and then there it is. Um, Amazing. And I know it's, it's really, really smart. And like you said, get on the list now, because I think that with what's going on in the world, we don't know. There's a lot of instability. Yeah. It would be wise to know who's growing your food yeah. and where your food is coming from. Because we don't know what's going to happen with the food supply. And then you have your direct connect to your farmer people. So you'll have um, a better chance of not starving. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> Thank you. This is, this is really great advice. And I'm actually going to take it to heart. Um, I'm going to finally join a CSA that I've been putting off. So thank you. Thank <laughs> Good you girl. <laughs> so um, is, are there any foods that you're loving this season right now or that you're really into making for yourself to kind of inspire anyone who's listening, who's kind of in a food rut? Oh, well, I mean, right now it's, it's squash season. So like the roasted squashes, I, I think are so yummy. And so even roasted potatoes, roasted rosemary potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm loving all of the, the heartier foods. Like I haven't even thought about a salad in, cause it's been so cold in New York. I haven't thought about yeah. a salad in weeks. Like I'm just, I just want like potatoes with like cream and butter, <laughs> you know, and like, so I'm like roasted chicken dish. That's what I, that's what I want. I want really the hearty foods, even like, um, 
uh, th this is where I really love all of the hearty greens as well. Yeah. And like I said, it's New York and it's cold. Like, are, are you on the West Coast? Yes. Yeah. So it's cold in New York right now, you know, 30 degrees yesterday and it's going to get down and then it's going to go up again. Um, so I want all of those hearty foods. I want um, sauteed kale with garlic and ginger. I want roasted roots. I want roasted um, squashes. I want roasted potatoes. I want roasted foods because that's a lot of heat right? That's a lot of heat going into the food energetically and it's cold here. So it's very warming and very comforting. Um, I'm also really enjoying stews. Me you too. Know, and I just yeah. made one yesterday for my clients and they couldn't resist. They were working from home that day. They dove in to have it for lunch and they said it just brought them so much mm. warmth and energy. And it was like a big hug. They hadn't had a stew like that in so long. Oh, what kind of stew did you make? Um, I did a traditional beef stew with mm. beef bone broth and it had, you know, carrot, celery, onion, parsnips, um, a little, you know, bay leaf, a little kombu. Um, it was just a really nice hearty stew. Very nice. And they had a reaction to it, a physiological reaction. Their body said, wow, that felt like a, a hug. <laughs> yeah. And what I think is really important is is the bone broth element mm. with the beef stew. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't buy any of the shelf stable bone broths. Um, I use my own bone broth, uh, one from fermentation farm or in the frozen section at health food stores, I'll buy the bona fide provisions or an, or an organic bone broth that's frozen, not mm. one that's been pasteurized sitting on the shelf. And right in that, the box. Yeah, that it doesn't, it's not just about the flavor, it's the energetics of it. Like you're now you're really getting something that's going to heal and nourish and support you, not dead food. Yeah. Yeah. How do you Very make smart. Your, yeah. Is there a particular stew you like making? Oh my God. I love them all. Uh, you know, I'm big on fish stews. My husband always jokes. He's like, you think you're Japanese? I'm like, I'm like no. <laughs> No, just because of my macrobiotic background, you know, yeah. from 20 years ago, I just love like what we've been eating for the past couple of weeks is like, um, uh, I make like a, a fish with soba noodles in a broth. Uh, and I just used like the turkey bones that we had from Thanksgiving. And I made a turkey stock and I used the turkey stock for the, um, uh, the noodle broth. And then I just, um, I roasted the fish and put the fish on top with some sauteed vegetables. It was so good. Wow. I need to so come yummy. to your place. You're going to get me out of some cooking <laughs> rats. I mean, I really have no desire to go to New York right now. No offense, but at least I know a restaurant that could potentially, you know. That's right. My kitchen. He's serving really good soba noodle <laughs> fish soup. I love it. Well, we need to start wrapping up and I want to make sure listeners know how they can learn more about you, how they can start to follow you, contact you if they need support with their health. Um, can you kind of share the different places where people can find you? Yeah, the best place to find me is www.andreabeeman.com because I don't know how much longer I'll be allowed to stay on social media <laughs> because I'm a little outspoken, but that's okay. I'm speaking my truth and yeah. it um, energizes my thyroid. <laughs> yes. You're supporting your thyroid health. Absolutely. The, and my heart, right? And your that, third chakra and yeah, your heart chakra. Yeah. yeah both chakras. You got totally it. Totally supporting them. Um, so that's the best place to find me. And then they could, you know, from there, they could find out all the other places like the Instagrams and the Facebook and all that stuff. Great. And if you were to kind of impart in our listeners one healthy tip that they can consider adding into their life to improve their well being, could you share? Yes. One healthy tip. When you wake up in the morning, give yourself a big hug, you know, either a, a real hug or, you know, just in your mind a hug and say, I love you. I'm supporting you on this journey. I'm going to take care of you. So put yourself first, first thing in the morning, and that'll set the precedent for the rest of your day. That's lovely. Thank you.
You're well, thank you so much for being on the Star Seed Kitchen podcast. I could talk to you for hours. I uh, really appreciate <laughs> your positive energy and um, all the wisdom that you are sharing with others. So thank you. Thanks, Whitney. All right. Hope to talk to you soon and take okay. care. Bye.